say about the midterm and about the remaining course schedule. And um, so I just wanted to kind of reflect on the schedule. So the midterm is the 29th. You have no classes between now and then. So you don't have any classes the next year. But is there something wrong? Oh, just is. Well. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, sorry. <laughs> All right. So, so, um, what I thought is that having Megan and, and me talk about the symmetrical historical things seems like the most boring <laughs> possible thing. I mean, it was something that I was interested in at the time that I wrote the original schedule. But the Fermi paradox is something much more interesting, I think. You know, if, if there are all these potentially habitable worlds in the universe, why don't we see any evidence for life from somewhere else? So, and the reason it's a legitimate subject in this course also is the video I have with the most views has to do with the Fermi paradox. The other thing that's kind of cool about it is there are many more thumbs down than thumbs up. I think because a lot of male viewers don't like what I say about the, the, the best leadership for the future and that sort of thing. So it's the idea of the great filter that maybe there's something in all civilized worlds out there where there's life that something happens that guarantees that, that they sort of kill each other off or that something ha happens and they don't end up populating the universe. And um, so what I argue in that video is you, you, you can think of you know, traditional male leadership, testosterone-infused, my way or the highway kind of thing, as maybe a reason that that might happen, whereas in a more collaborative sort of uh, female-style leadership, we might actually make it past the best builders, the, the great builders. So that's what I suggest there. And Gagan had found this other video that talks about the fact that the identification that there are aliens among us could be the worst news that the human race ever receives. But that's a rather simplistic video. It, it, it means that if there are aliens, that means that the great filter is, is ahead of us and we have a lot to fear. It's possible we're already past it, that we have passed some crucial threshold where everybody else didn't survive beyond that, but we already have. You know, like it could be the start of agriculture or something, I don't know. Uh, um, maybe something technology based. So I think it, it's not an area where simplistic thinking makes much sense. We, we really don't know anything about this. So assuming that the presence of aliens would be bad for us is kind of stupid. We don't know, you know. It could, could go either way. So I, I will send you those two uh, videos, the one that Gagan found and the one that I did about three years ago that has nearly 2,000 views now. So, um, yeah. so that's, that's what we're doing on the 5th. I thought on the 7th we, we, we could let uh, Gary Goldsand do a final ethics lecture. There might be some, uh, some ethics related to the Fermi paradox and stuff or leftover stuff from the self-driving car. Then there is reading week. And then um, I thought may maybe we could just do one class period where we talk about the student presentations and kind of strategies 
to, to uh, uh, get ready for that. And then the presentations would start on the 21st, so we could potentially do two each on the 21st. The uh, 26th, the 28th of November, and then on December 5th. So um, the, the paper is due on the 21st. I kind of like the idea of having class on the day that the paper is due because it allows for a face-to-face -face encounter where students who want to physically print out a paper and hand it to me can actually do that. And, and so, um, and the other thing is that the 7th is the deadline for choosing your paper and presentation topic and mentor. And uh, it is a good idea to, to have that decision made uh, um, well before you give the actual presentation and turn in the paper. Obviously, the, the more time between those two, <laughs> the better in a sense. So, so that's do on the seventh. I want to hear from all of you about your your choice of the final topic. So, any thoughts at the moment of what you, what you want to do about the timing of the final presentations? Do you like the idea of doing two per day? Do you want to bunch them up more, or what are your thoughts about that? If we do two per day, how many days is that? Eight That's days, four, four, days. four days. Yeah. And I start on the 21st, the first day. Yeah, so we would do two student presentations on the 21st of November, two on the 26th, two on the 28th, and two on the 5th of December. And your papers for everybody would be due on the 21st. Um, there's a certain advantage, I guess, you know, first mover advantage, kind of, you can set the tone for the presentations and stuff by presenting early, um, and that way you don't have to worry about it all, all the next period of time. On the other hand, you, you, you may want to wait until later. So, we don't have to decide it today. I just and pointing out that this is something the students decide and then we'll do whatever you want. Um, the thing that really doesn't work is doing all eight presentations on the last day because the student who presents last, <laughs> I sort of like a uh, uh, worn out, uh, hamburger by the end of the seventh presentation, so I'm not quite as receptive as I was at the beginning. Yeah, so that, that's one reason for not doing them on the same day. We can also do, do them out of class time if you wish. We could mix them with fun stuff. We could get N Nikolai Smith here to entertain us and, you know, we, we could have music and food and drink and all that kind of fun stuff, or not. <laughs> so any strong feelings about that or things you want to discuss now or you want to just sort of think about it for, for a while? I have a question. Yes. Like, I'm just kidding. He's like, what is this paper about? Yeah, so the, the paper has to be uh, kind of unique to the course. In other words, if it's just something, let's take the technology of the pacemaker, right? So that's technology and medicine. It's not really the future, but so if you just sort of get a paper on past, present, and future of the pacemaker, that probably would not get a passing grade because it doesn't have the whole idea of uh, you know, exponential change, Moore's law, the future going much faster than, you know, not just the kind of linear 
trajectory, but that curve upward, nothing about existential risk, all the other things that are unique to the course. So it, it has to have that futuristic feel, you know, that, that you've taken a course that's different from other courses and <laughs> the final presentation um, has to be different from one you, you would do in some other course. But it can be on any subject. It can be the you know, machine replacement of human labor in such and such a field or, or uh, you know, the future of something that nobody's ever done the future of before. I, I told you in the past that one of the most interesting presentations we ever had was a student who took the least appetizing um, subject you could possibly think of, the future of war, and then shot a, a sort of documentary video in a children's playground with all these cute kids playing in the background on a windy day and without uh, wind protection on the, on the microphone. So it's a really dynamic and watchable and, and sort of fun um, video. Uh, and so the, the, the shy presenter provision means that you can do that rather than giving a live presentation. You can do a presentation to a videographer and then present your video and answer questions about that rather than speaking live. So the student who did that wasn't particularly shy but liked <laughs> that option. So, so that's why he did that. Um, yeah, so it, it can be on any of the subjects we've talked about or similar things that we haven't talked about. Like what is the impact of future technological change, the uh, technological singularity, the fact that machines are as smart as we are in 2029, as smart as the whole human race in 2045. What's the impact of that on X, Y, Z? Okay, was that different from what you thought? I, I didn't know. <laughs> okay. uh, did you talk about it last week? Maybe that's like same as Thursday's class? Or no? Maybe you don't know. Well, I, yeah. I talked about it the very first day. Yeah. I talked about it in yeah. the first session. So. That's cool. Yes. So for finding a mentor, does it have to be someone who has taught or lectured in this course before? It, 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 yeah, it, it needs to be somebody who has taught in this course ever. Okay. So that includes students, number of people your own age, Shauna, Pandya, uh, yeah, Simon Wu, and, and so on. So. Is this a new thing, like a mentor thing? No, no, the mentor thing isn't new, and it's also not required. It's just something that you can do. So, I mean, I, I can be your mentor. You may decide you're, you're really confident about choices that you're making and you don't need a mentor. But if you do, it's just somebody to talk to about what your plans are, how, how to confine that subject to a 20-minute presentation, what to keep in, what to take out, you know, kind of strategies for success in the final paper and final presentation. So it's like an argument type of like essay. You're you're arguing something for the future that you believe in? It it can be like that. It it can be something where you're taking a stand or it can be a situation where you feel you know exactly what's going to happen and you're simply describing that. Um, you know, like the future of janitorial work, right? So what's it going to be like in like 15 years <laughs> when you come to, to a building after hours and it's being cleaned, who or what is actually cleaning it? And so, and every other job is sort of like that. You can imagine a time 
when machines are better at doing that job than we are. So what's going to happen then? And then what will human beings do when not only you're unemployed, but everybody you know is unemployed and you're all getting sort of subsidized income so all your needs are met? But what will be the meaning of life and, you know, how, how how will you, when you meet a new person, how will you describe who you are to them? Um, what, what will be the thing that you talk about? Will you talk about the immersive video game that's, uh, you know, uh, better than real life and shareable with friends? <laughs> Is that what you'll talk about? Is that something that that you help to create, or is it just something that you sort of consume? Uh, are, are, what is creativity like? You know, how, how are creative, and, or will everybody be creative somehow? Will we all be smarter uh, because of improvements in our own biology and brain implants and so on? Yeah. So. It, it, it could be the distant future, it could be short-term future, probably like next year is too short. <laughs> it could be like 10, 15 years from now or a much longer time. <coughs> yeah. So does it have to include um, a medical aspect or just the future of technology? Because what, So medicine writ large is an important concept in this course, and that's probably many of you think of that as something akin to social work or something. In other words, what will doctors do when the, all of the diseases of today are easily, either no longer present or easily prevented or cured? Well, it, it's a matter then of human enhancement not only uh, physical, but moral, spiritual, and then improving society so that society functions better, is fairer, so that we're naturally healthier because there's less poverty and, and stuff like that. So that giant thing is medicine writ large. So in a sense, that's what the course is, is about. So it goes way beyond just things like drugs for specific diseases and you know, therapies for things that go wrong. And also contemplates a uh, future where all of the limits, like when you wake up in the morning, you feel this regret of all the things you wanted to do, you can't do, and all the things you wanted to have, you can't have. It, it could be none of that is there in the future. That That's actually a bigger problem. Suppose you can do anything that you want to do and you can have anything that, that you want to have. What do you do now? then? You know, how, how will you decide amongst the possibilities in a uh, utopian world? Um, so, so, yeah. does it have to be largely predictive from our own opinion, or should we research? No, no it, it, it can be heavily referenced. You find a cool paper in it, and, and you kind of expand on that, and, and so it's somebody else's idea that you then say, well, if that is true, then what about that, and that, and that, and that, and you kind of you know, grow a whole new scenario from someone else's idea of what the future will be like. So it doesn't have to be based on your own experience, and there are, are no rigid format requirements. Um, it isn't that you're going to get dinged if, like, your reference style is wrong, or if, if it's one word over the word limit, or something like that. We're pretty flexible, uh, but the students have, have, have required that there be a penalty for turning in your paper plate, just like there's a penalty for nothing. 
you're not counting here. So you you lose five points for each day that your paper is left. Um, but we're, we're very flexible about format. I like surprises. You don't have to do something no one has done before, but if you do, I, I you know, it kind of makes my day, and I'm really pleased about it, and it gives me something that I can talk about to future classes. Um, I guess maybe the future of war is only going to be a topic once. I'm not really looking forward to that to have it again. But yeah, so I don't know. I think, and part of it, you, you want to be comfortable with you doing whatever topic you pick. So if, if, if you're a person who's really uncomfortable doing something for the first time that nobody's ever done before, then you would pick one kind of paper. Maybe if you're a person who is only comfortable doing something that no one's ever done before, then that would be another kind of paper. So either, either one would be fine. Um, Okay, so maybe what we will do next is Sarah and I can talk to you about the quantum biology part of it. Um, so much of the midterm exists. The only part that doesn't exist yet is the ethics part. Um, so yeah, just just to give you some some idea. So there are choices like on the quantum biology short answer part. There are seven questions, and you choose four out of seven. So you get a lot of leeway there, and you, you pick something that you're more comfortable answering. And blackening pages, filling up all the white space, you don't get any credit for that. So if, if you completely answer the question and there's still white space left in that little part of the paper, that's fine. You're not going to be marked down because you didn't make that square completely black, right? And you know, if you if you feel you've completely answered it, you just move on move on to the next. You don't have to like, write a uh, large number of words. So the, the things, um, we're, we're really interested in quantum biology in, in the big picture, and the big picture that uh, a scientist or somebody who knows something about science who's not taken quantum physics can actually understand. So, you know, we're not trying to get you to learn uh, quantum physics during those lectures, but to kind of have an, an idea what the impact of quantum physics is and how it could affect biology. And then the sort of analogy between the state of physics 100 or 200 years ago and the state of biology now. And, and how does that analogy work? Uh, what can and cannot be explained at the moment? What can't be explained by classical physics that can be explained by quantum physics in terms of common everyday things that, that people might care about? Um, Then, uh, what, what, what are some examples of, of things that are part of biology that probably can only be explained through quantum uh, phenomena? And then what are the main objections to using quantum physics in the context of uh, biology systems? Um, and um, some features of quantum mechanics that would be useful in biology. 
And then the elementary scaling laws in physiology and their connection to quantum biology. Um, now that's something I think that is mostly when uh, Jack goes over here on the board and, and scribbles down stuff, that's when he's talking about those, that, those things, those big picture things. So, so it's unlikely that you're going to be um, frustrated by the fact that you don't have the slide set for all of his lectures and you know, something deeply buried in one of the slides that, we're, that you're going to crucially need to know. <laughs> that really isn't the case. You need to know the kind of big picture here. Um, and then the, the whole thing of the human body as an engine, the brain as an engine, how, how efficient is it, how many watts is it, that kind of thing. Yeah, so that's another kind of, it's a cool thing to take away from this course. You, you can imagine there's hardly anybody who wouldn't be interested in that, right? So that, that, that's what we're trying to teach you. Things that are useful, not only useful during the day, useful in the evening, you know. When you're just talking with so, somebody, it turns out you have much more interesting things to say than they do because you know how many watts the human body is, <laughs> the human brain, and stuff like that. Yeah. So, Simon, any thoughts? Yeah, so for like, ever since like grade one all the way to grade 12, even in university, you've been learning what kind of physics, right? Classical physics. So it's really important to just know like, what's the point of quantum physics, right? Like, why are we even creating this? Why is this new field, right? Like, what's the point? So knowing that, and not going in depth, like no equations, just like the general idea. Like, what's the point of having these new theories in place? And then knowing about like, their application on biology. Like what's the benefit? Like what advantage? For example, that glottis opens up and it allows me to breathe. That's super like causal, right? So that's like classical physics, but then like finding examples and reasons like how can quantum physics better explain other phenomena in the body? So stuff like that. Yeah, like the sense of sight and smell, the fact that you can identify one photon, that can't be explained by classical physics. And yet, when you're just lying there at night and it's very dark and that one photon <laughs> appears, it is sort of fascinating, you know. How, how is it that I can see that? You know, I, I know there, there is just a little bit of light now. How, how is that physically? Possible. And detecting odors is is similar. So, and and there are a whole bunch of other things that also are very hard hard to explain in this classical physics. Um, the two overlap, and so there there is no absolute size of things where one is relevant and the other not, but the, the bigger things are, the more it's in the realm of the classical physics. Uh, you know, like if you look at the movement of large trucks and, and stuff, <laughs> there probably, probably are some quantum phenomena, but they're, they're pretty minuscule. So like ping pong balls and stuff like that are used in many way classical ways. And if you talk to people later about this course, the AI part of this course isn't like that much ahead of the AI part of AI courses, right? So so the quantum biology part of this course is really the most sort of out there part of the course. It is the most forward looking. Um, it is the highest impact. If, if you look at the lectures from the course that have the most views, they're, they're the quantum biology lectures. Some of them have very odd uh, audience retention curve because like Jack's going somewhere to give a talk and people decide 
to get ready. They don't watch, watch his videos. They all watch a certain part, like the part where he says, all the textbooks will be rewritten and so on. Yeah, so, so, so you're going along and, you know, the average video has a lot of views at the beginning and then people get bored and sort of trails off. But one of those, you get almost to the end, he starts talking about all the textbooks being rewritten. There's this huge blip there where people were probably assigned to go back and like watch that over and over before actually meeting him in person. I wanted to also say there's no ideal semester or term to, to take this course. Like, you may feel bad, badly that Jack is in Italy and, you know, so on, but, but um, like, a year from now, Osmer is on sabbatical. He, he's actually very hard to replace, too, you know. I mean, to totally replace, to have exactly the same impact. Um, and so, and, with the, with the need to always have new subjects, we're always trying things out and, and so on. Some of the things we try out, like the Pokemon Go lecture that we had, that was really exciting that time that we had it, but it would be really boring now because you know, the subject is passe, nobody cares, right? Whereas then it was, it was, it was yeah, something highly topical. So some of our subjects are like that. So, um, and the other thing is, if these the subjects that, that we have lectures on in future terms interest you, you can come back. You, you're free to come back. We we. we we often have a lot of people who are not taking the course who actually come to watch lectures. So that, that, that opportunity is open to you. Um, and you can help us improve the course by suggesting facets that you know I hadn't thought of or um, other ways to make it Better. The midterm came from a student suggestion. You know, a lot of the things that we do were ideas that students had. As I told you, I had, had the impression that the easier the course, the more the students would like it, but that's not true because if your advisor thinks the course is not rigorous enough, then it's not going to work for you. So. Uh, adding the midterm really made the, the, the um, course much more appealing. And I, I've scaled the grades on the midterm the way I'm doing it now since the very first midterm. And that seems, seems to be working. So, um, yeah. So, other questions? The uh, ethics part. Um, is similar to the, the quantum biology in that it is sort of common sense of, okay, we get students from all different faculties, all different walks of life in this course. So we're, we're going to ask you about mainstream things that everybody should be getting out of ethics rather than things that require a background in medicine, nursing, you know, business, whatever. So, so trying to keep it in a general realm. Um, so, any other questions, thoughts? Um, do you just focus on one paper, or...? So your, your paper and your presentation are on the same subject. Okay. But your paper, in terms of the number of 
references that it can have, that's sort of up to you. You know, it could, could be just one or two things that really have, have inspired you, or it could be that you delve into something in great detail, so you ended up with 50, 60 references. And, and, and uh, yeah, so that's totally up to you. The, um, the uh, graphics, the pictures that are in your paper or that are in your presentation, we like to know where they're from. Um, it, it just, it's um, useful also to know if you created them all yourself or, you know, that, that's another option. So, so but we, we, we want to know where they came from. Um, if they're from you know, a highly protected source, then we really ought to ask those people before we put up your uh, presentation. So, So it's, is the course meeting your expectations so far, or, or what, what are your thoughts in, in the, what you thought it was going to be, or better, worse? <laughs> There's a wide range of subjects, and we get experts from the field coming in from different faculties, and it's like very interdisciplinary. So I really like that. And I learned a lot about AI, and I didn't even know about how we had the Amy or Amy here. Yeah. And all that. Yeah. So that's been interesting. No, I mean it, this is it, it's one of the good things about being in Edmonton and at, and at the U of A. You know, this this is one of the strongest places for the AI in the world. Um, Google DeepMind is in two places, London, UK, and here. So, yeah, it's really cool. Um, in uh, transplantation, we're uh, seventh in the world. So, I mean, that's also That's another field that I, I sort of represent. Okay, so so are, are the videos um, are are the things that could be improved about them or? or videos of course. Yeah. yeah. What? Yeah. So you know I I used to do detailed indexing. <coughs> and that it, it's interesting why that's a really bad idea. So if you do a really granular index of the video takes on all the mystique, right? <laughs> I mean, when you start a video, you don't quite know what you're going to encounter. Except if there's such a detailed video that you, detailed index, that you find you do know exactly. And then you quickly decide, well, I'm not going to watch the video because I can read this index in a minute. And so why should I spend like 80 minutes watching something where, yeah. So, what, what's more valuable in a way, and also equally mystifying to the video itself, is to take the audience retention peaks, the peaks where people go back to the video and watch parts over and over, and just write down what's being said at those peaks, 
And it's intriguing enough that it makes you want to watch the video, but it does give you some rough idea of where things are. Right? So that's what we do now when, when there is some sort of index. And, and that works a lot better. People still watch the video because they want to kind of fill in the blanks. As I post like my presentation, right? Yes, yeah. And also, like, I can have the link to the Prezi if you want to hear me talk, right? And then right. I have a better visual for the presentation, right? And not have, right? Because I think the presentation itself is like decent. You don't yeah. have to sit through like me talking because I think I talk really fast or really slow. So that would be another resource. Sure, yeah. No, I think that would. That would be useful. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't have Jack's Um, I think just like maybe like a suggestion for future years is that um, all of the presenters that we've had have all been men. Um, it would be kind of cool if there was like a woman who came in and did a presentation on like some topic that like they're like focused on. Um, I think it would just be a nice time. Right. Well, well the, the self driving car mm -hmm. presentation, yeah, it is, is a woman. And um, we, we've had awesome women in the past. I mean, what happened with Shauna and Pandya is she became too much of a superstar. Um, really, I mean, it, if you look at the places where she's doing things and the people she's presenting to, it just doesn't make sense to present to such a small audience as, as this. Um, and it's intriguing that her presentations were never the most popular videos, and of course there are many of them. So you can watch her, but she she's really like the most unique female role model that we've had uh, repeatedly. So we've had her since 2011. Uh, Leslie. Cormac, the Dean of Arts, has only taught here once, but it's really impactful in many ways. So she hands me her slide deck, and there are only 16 slides. I'm like, what is this? You didn't prepare, you know, what's wrong? <laughs> this is like such an awesome uh, presentation, because what she's showing you is in the Middle Ages, Medicine was as complete as it is today. If you had a medical problem, the doctors and soothsayers and black and white magic people and all the people you might go and see with the problems you had, they had answers for everything and therapies and, you know, many of these, they, they were as detailed, like, you know, the, the egg of a newt and all that. <laughs> I mean, it's not like therapies of, of today. But it was very detailed, and they could explain why things were happening. So medicine of the Middle Ages was as complete in that sense as our medicine is today. And so what does that mean? It means some of the th therapies that we have today that we're very proud of, that we're sure it's the right stuff, and that we know exactly what's going on, Sort of like the uh, egg of the newt, you know. It's it's <laughs> at some point we will realize that was so primitive, and so the, there's a Star Trek episode where somebody's being dialyzed, and uh, so McCoy says, "What is this? The Dark Ages?" So so anyway, it sort of gives you perspective on how good medicine today is how proud we should be that we have therapies for everything, you know. Uh, that's actually been, been the case for a long time. Now, I thought the best idea I ever had for this course was to get the Dean of Science and the Dean of Arts to debate each other. And they were kind of willing, but then the uh, financial uh, impact of, of cuts uh, at the university really meant that they were competing with each other financially and they didn't want to like have a you know face to face debate and, and, and seem to harm harm the interests of the other faculty and that. 
so so that that would have been cool if if things get better here financially where we're, we're having surpluses and so on we could actually do that because this case this course is kind of uh, unique in, in how broadly appealing it is to multiple faculties we, we could sort of get faculties talking to each other like that some point in the future um, yeah, I, I completely agree with you that, that we need more women, and I like that idea also because it's an easy thing to fix. Some of the other things you, you might have suggested, like, we need somebody to teach nanotechnology. I, I know we do, but it, that that is much harder than you think, you know. We've, we've had it on again, off again, and and uh, we, we will solve it in, in the long run. But pretty tough right at the moment to figure out who, who should teach it. <clears throat> Any other suggestions, questions? Okay. Well, I, I will see you all on the 29th. And um, so you can also contemplate the other things. What is going to be your Paper one, um, you feel you need the advice of Linda and who you need and so on. Okay, so I wish you a uh, good uh, week and a half, I guess. <laughs> I'll see you on the 29th. Okay.